Lord be with you. If you're joining us online, uh, please bring your own Christ candle and we will light them together. Go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. The Lord be with you. Yes. Announcements that we have, um, keep in mind that um, each Sunday we have a brunch between the 9 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service. And if you've got a, a recipe you've just been dying to try or experiment on other folks with, it's time to, to fix that and bring it. Mention one great hour of, of sharing uh, upcoming. Any announcements for that? Um, I was, when I just said it's going on on the poster, information about it at the church. Holy Week, week services uh, coming up starting um, April 14th, Monday, Thursday, Thursday, April 14th. Easter sunrise service, uh, 5.45 a.m. Easter Sunday, April 17th, and we'll meet at the West parking lot uh, visitor center, and we'll walk together up to the lake shore. That's always a great service. I hope you'll join us. Easter campfire breakfast and Easter egg hunt, 8.30 with uh, the Easter egg hunt at 9. Uh, Amber, uh, Amber Lewis Stewart will... Uh, help run that if you are interested see amber i forgot to write it down for terry but we um we will be having a unity service at 10 a.m in here for easter sunday as well the story that we're going to look at today involves a moment around a table and that is something that was very very frequent in jesus's ministry even up to the last supper the night before he died we're in the fifth week of lent and we're going to hear a story of love and devotion from the disciple mary and what she did in our story as you'll hear in a while was unexpected it was very vulnerable was really uncomfortable and it was extravagant and through her actions we're going to learn more about the god we serve who wants us just to be good enough not perfect not best just good enough and god can work with that Tomorrow, void of sorrow, time spent regretting decisions of our yesterdays, mistakes we made, sometimes we get what we get, life disappoints us and yet. This faith is good enough. What in our lives do we dream about for tomorrow? Void of sorrow, time spent regretting decisions of our yesterdays, mistakes we made. Sometimes we get what we get. Life disappoints us and yet God is still here and somehow this faith is good enough. <laughs>
Let us pray together. Holy One, lover of souls, we call out to you. You know our tears and sorrows, and you hear the seeds of grief with us. Open us this day to your comfort that nurtures these seeds into sheaves of joy, the simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. Please stand if you're able. Please be seated. Honest questions, compassionate response. Jesus speaks the words no one wanted to admit. He was not always going to be around. Oh, don't say that. So many of us have said to a loved one who speaks the truth about the fragility of life. Perhaps we get uncomfortable because it reveals the precious nature of the present moment laying bare the beauty and horror of it all. The indescribable pain we know we will one day face invades our senses like a pervasive perfume, inescapable. What if we stop denying the limited nature of our lives and breathed in deeply the fragrance of vulnerability? Let us take a moment of silent reflection.
hear this compassionate word from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Know that already God is offering us freedom from the need to avoid suffering at the cost of denying the fullness of life. We are invited into the knowledge of that Christ's vulnerability in life, death, and resurrection shows us the sacred nature of the heights and depths of sorrow and joy in our own saga. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps in the name of Jesus Christ, you're being forgiven even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 126. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyous shouts. It was even said at that time among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are overjoyed. Lord, change our circumstances for the better, like dry streams in the desert waste. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. The word of God for the people of God. This is truly a put together song. Uh, the the tune comes from uh, oh goodness. 1900, 1900, um, and it was, it's, it's basically called a song for peace. We have two hymns in our hymn book that are, that use this tune. Um, the words, most of the, well, the first verse of the words uh, was written in, were written in uh, between the two world wars, World War One and Two. And the other verses were written within the last few months as, uh, as Ukraine was, is being invaded. This is a song for peace. This is my song. Oh, 
out of curiosity, is the um, good enough theme impacting you guys at all? Oh, good. I hear yes. Yes. Good. Um, I got out some knitting that I had, I had made a mess of it, sort of. It wasn't a, you know, fatal error, but it wasn't great. Definitely wasn't perfect, not even close. But I just decided, you know what, I'm just gonna, it was too too much to unwrap. Anyway, I started on it again and it was like, I get to the end of the row and the count might be off and not ah, good enough and go on. So anyway, our scripture today is a poignant, intimate look into the days before Jesus would enter Jerusalem the last time before his death. The scene is one of the few things that is described in all four of the accounts of Jesus' life and ministry, the Gospels. Today, we're going to look at John's version. John 12, verses 1 through 8 from the Common English Bible. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus and his sisters hosted a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who joined him at table. Then Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound, of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet dry with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, complained, this perfume is worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. This perfume was, used, was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. A word of God that is still speaking. So before we really get into all the theology and stuff, let's just talk about nard for a minute. Um, you learn the most interesting trivia when you research this stuff. In addition to being incredibly expensive and rare, nard grows at very high altitudes and has really pretty pink flowers. It was used for burial preparations, childbirth as a sedative, all kinds of things. And weirdly, its, it's smell is incredibly attractive to cats. <laughs> so now you know. <laughs> um, so I showed this vision of Mary pouring this out and all the cats going, hello. <laughs> So here they are, dinner with friends, close friends. And Mary stops it all as if to anoint Jesus for a burial. And he's okay with that. Now remember, her brother Lazarus, also sitting at this table, was recently dead and buried, and Jesus raised him from the dead. Here he is, risen, scooting up to the table for dinner like it ain't no thing. I really wish the writer had spent just a little more on that part. I mean, just that's it. And Lazarus was there. 
Like, wait, <laughs> you know, anyway. So Mary pours perfume worth a year's wages over his feet and then wipes them clean with her hair. It is vulnerable, it's uncomfortable, and it's extravagant. And I think as we look at that, the vulnerability, the uncomfortableness, and the extravagance, we are reminded God is like that too. That's what God is like. Mary knew things were getting dangerous for Jesus. She couldn't protect him from what was coming, but she could do this for him. She could share a very vulnerable moment as she anointed his feet with a perfume usually saved to prepare a loved one for burial, for that final and permanent goodbye. We know vulnerability, don't we? But we don't necessarily like it. The pandemic has forced a sort of vulnerability on us these past two years, a protracted, invasive vulnerability. We're all too aware of this virus and, and the power and havoc and death it has wrought. And the spread of misinformation and the politicizing of science has made it worse. We can't help but be made more aware of our own fragility and vulnerability. Because by now we all know someone whose life was cut short by this virus. Jesus, in allowing and accepting Mary's gift, becomes vulnerable with her in that moment. You know, I don't know if he knew during this dinner exactly when and how he would die, but he certainly knew and he could certainly tell things were reaching an explosive point for him politically with the powers that be. In this scene, this lavish display, Mary becomes vulnerable to the stares and the judgments of those gathered there. Then we have Judas, who's doing everything he can to avoid uh, vulnerability with his deflection. That's expensive. What about the poor? Judas, like many of us do, is trying to stay above and beyond, untouched by this moment, this intimate, vulnerable, tender scene happening between Mary and Jesus. Vulnerability, fragility, it's uncomfortable and scary, but... When it's met with love and grace and affirmation and acceptance, it's truly transformative for everyone involved. That's what God is like. God chooses to take on the most vulnerable form imaginable, a newborn baby born to a refugee family far from home and trusting the care of the Savior to peasant parents in a violent culture. In Christ, God remains vulnerable, walking among us, feeling our hungers, our desires, the vagaries of grief and joy, the limits of being an embodied human. In the next few weeks, as we lean into his death and resurrection, we are again reminded of Jesus's vulnerability with the humiliation of the cross of God's vulnerability in allowing his death to happen. Do we dare to risk vulnerability with one another? Can we offer one another the grace and love and affirmation, the acceptance that can make vulnerability transformative? Now our conversation groups in, the, in this service, we could talk about the weather the whole time we could keep things on the surface or these small groups can become holy spaces where we can sometimes, not all the time, sometimes risk vulnerability that can lead to the transformation of us all into something a bit more like Jesus. That's what God is like, showing us the incredible and surprising power of vulnerability. I also said that this passage shows us that following Jesus can be uncomfortable. Sitting around the table while Mary is pouring perfume on Jesus' feet, watching while she wipes her feet with her hair, smelling that strong aroma, it's uncomfortable. It's so sensual in the sense of 
involving the senses, engaging them. Mary went against all kinds of social codes to do this. She let her hair down among people who were not in her family. She used her hair to wipe Jesus's feet clean. Those of us with short hair would be very challenged. But th that was no more appropriate then than it would be now. It was uncomfortable, believe me. The intimate physicality of it is hard to process. But the passage seems to hint that Mary, knowing she was choosing vulnerability, knowing it would make people uncomfortable, couldn't not do this. Can we also risk making others uncomfortable to embody our love for Jesus? During the past few Pride Month celebrations in Nashville, some of us have walked in, marched in the parade to show our support for our LGBT brothers and sisters and siblings. The last two parades, I carried a sign that said, free pastor hugs. The first time I carried that sign, I really thought it was gonna be pretty much no big thing. It was gonna be ignored because it wasn't original to me, the idea. I had seen it in some Facebook post or something and thought, oh, that's cool, I'll do that. I was really wrong. Um, people, I lost track of the number of people who would run, I mean, full on run, stop, look at me and say, can I have a hug? With their voice catching on their tears. And then they would hug me tight, tight, I mean, really tight, weeping. And then they would whisper their thanks. There's a group called Dykes on Bikes. <laughs> and they're some tough women, let me tell you. And I remember coming around a corner from Broadway onto Second Avenue, and one of these women wearing leather grabs a teenager and kind of throws her at me going, you need a pastor hug here. I was like, okay, let's hug, okay. So um, it made me a little uncomfortable to be honest, I felt like I, I can't, I don't know what your experience is. I don't know the story behind your tears. I, you know, I'm a Presbyterian, all that emotion. <laughs> but it also made me more determined than ever to create a welcome for those folks who have been so excluded from so many places to welcome them into our family with open arms to sit at this table with us. Because here, they will not be other. They are part of us. What if we went against social norms and risked making people uncomfortable to have more support for our LGBT folks during Pride Month? What if we visibly made the welcome wider with our sign, our social media presence? We might make some people uncomfortable, but we might also welcome people who have been turned away from so many tables to sit at this table with us. So as I said, the scene is uncomfortable. It's awkward, but God is like that. That's what God is like. Jesus made people uncomfortable fairly often. He ate with sinners and tax collectors. He had a long conversation with a Samaritan woman, shocking his disciples. He, he fed 5,000 people with some kid's Lunchable. He pitched a fit and flipped tables in the temple. That's uncomfortable. As we enter Holy Week, Palm Sunday next Sunday, we'll, we'll talk about the pain and disorientation of the Last Supper the betrayal by Judas, the arrest, the torture, the crucifixion, all of that is uncomfortable. To follow Jesus, to enter into his story means being willing to sit with the pain of the cross before we celebrate the joy of the resurrection. And our willingness to explore the uncomfortable pain of Good Friday equips us for a deeper joy on Easter Sunday morning. God is willing for us to be vulnerable and uncomfortable 
in order to transform us more into the likeness of Jesus. Finally, Mary's action. This pure nard poured out on Jesus' feet and wiped clean with her hair. That is extravagant. It's over the top. Judas was right about one thing. Mary's gifts and actions made no sense, not socially and not financially. But Jesus told Judas to leave her alone and affirmed what she was doing. Mary spent lavishly on this, only to pour it all out at once. To pour it like her love and her worship at the feet of Jesus. I think Jesus knew death was unavoidable and imminent at this meal with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. I have to wonder, did this extravagant, costly, over-the-top gesture, did this give Jesus some strength and comfort as he faced that dangerous, harrowing week before his death? We don't know what that sound is. All right. As I've mentioned, we are heading into Easter. When we look at the news, it is hard to think about celebrating, about having an Easter morning campfire breakfast with an Easter egg hunt. It's hard to think about shouting our hosannas with so much wrong in the world. How can we have lavish meals and the frivolousness of baskets of candy when there is so much suffering? We can do that because pain and joy always coexist in this world. And they do not cancel each other out. Pain will find us. We know this. We will all go through suffering of some kind or another. So when we have a reason for joy, it behooves us to be like Mary, a little over the top, a little extravagant in celebrating it. Because that's what God is like over the top, extravagant. God's love for all of us and each of us, becoming one of us for, for love of us, is over the top. Calming a storm with, few, with a few words is over the top and extravagant. Taking on death itself and winning for our sakes, that's extravagant. And this symbolic meal we're about to share, the Lord's Supper. Here, we sit at table and eat, eating, drinking together. That's a fundamentally vulnerable act with people who sometimes make us feel uncomfortable. And we are all welcomed to both soak in and then share the ridiculous, extravagant, over-the-top love that is present for us here. Because that's what God is like. Amen. Talk about a moment of generosity. You are invited to pr uh, prayerfully consider how God might be calling you to use your time, energy, love, kindness, and finances to be a blessing to others this week. For those who would like to contribute to the ongoing ministries of Southminster and Telos, you may use the QR code shown in your bulletin or place a, a check or cash in the offering plate here at the front of the church. Thank you. Mercy. be seated. Christ looks upon each one with love and says, you are welcome at my table. Christ looks upon each one with compassion and says, 
Whatever troubles you, bring it here. Christ looks upon each one with grace and says, whatever you'd like to leave behind, do it here. Will you come? Will you bring your troubles? Will you shed all that is unnecessary in your life? This is the place where you need not be perfect. You need not be sure of yourself and your faith. You need not feel whole and right with the world. Jesus invited many to his tables. And in doing so, he assured them of their place in the illogical reign of love and grace. He just wanted them to be hungry for relationship, hungry to look across the table into one another's eyes, to break open their lives and lift a cup in the midst of the hard times. And here, this is for all. And so this is for you, beloved. The holy living God be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing anytime and everywhere to give thanks to you, God. You created this world full of so much beauty and sorrow and called it good and called it enough. Although we feel lost at times, you are ever-present. We doubt, resist, turn away, and rage, insistent on our own power to pull us through, and yet sure that we are to blame, making life seem like a confusing paradox. But you are patient. You are here to meet us, reside with us in this strange and alienating times, always faithful, always present, in this body represented at this table, and in this body represented in these people. And so together we proclaim the praise-filled truth of your glory, along with all the saints. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He proclaimed freedom for the bound, justice for the oppressed, grace for the lost, love for the prodigal. Through the life and ministry of Jesus, we can imagine and live into a community where all who struggle are taken into loving arms, and those who struggle to love are invited into greater compassion. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This bread is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup at the end of the meal, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink this cup, all of you. This cup represents the new covenant poured out in my blood until I come again. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you celebrate my life and my death. So we remember, we offer ourselves, 
we proclaim God's time. Christ has died, yet Christ is risen. Christ will come once again. We remember and proclaim redeeming love. Oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us sustenance for our days, love for simple and ordinary lives, fuel for justice in this world. By your spirit, open us to each other, open us to the world, making us one in you through Christ, who taught us to pray together with these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Grateful, O oh God, for your amazing grace, we sing together. Is prepared. Come, eat. I invite you to come up the center aisle, tear a piece of bread off, and then dip it into the cup. We ask that you would allow our musicians to come first, and then anyone who um, needs gluten-free, we have crackers. We also have our self-contained communion for those of you who are more comfortable with that. So all is prepared, friends. Let us eat the Lord's Supper. Thank you. 
briefly stand and join us in singing our final hymn number 223. <coughs> When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but love. And bore content on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. charm me most I sacrifice them to his blood see from his head his hands his feet so My life, my all. Please be seated. Before we have our final um, blessing and benediction, I want to take some time to hear prayer requests and pray for the things that are on your heart. And we will start with the people on Zoom. Um, and I'll let Jen just holler at me who's raising hands. Nobody raising hands. Are there any prayer requests here in the sanctuary? Bethany. Uh, prayers for Lauren and Mike. They both have COVID. Oh, gosh. Okay. And also, um, Mike's mom lives in Sacramento, California, and there apparently has been a shooting out there, a mass shooting. Oh, so nice. prayers for all the people out there involved in that. All right. Let's, let's pray. God, we pray for quick recovery for Mike and Lauren. Pray that you would help them to um, have patience with one another as they are quarantining together. And Lord, for all whose lives are touched by this shooting, we ask your mercy. We ask for courage for those who have the power to make these things less likely. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others? Susan. Mm -hmm. um, I'm repeating it for the people on Zoom, so I'm not just repeating it. <laughs> Um, Susan has asked for prayers for the continued healing of John Baker 
And for the kids and staff of our own Southminster Child Care who have been waging a battle against the norovirus, they had to close two days this week just to try to get a grip on it. And I know um, Kiana has it this morning and you know so many of the teachers it's we just need to pray for them it's miserable from what i hear let's pray god for our brother john thank you for the joy he brings so many of us we ask that you would touch and heal him give wisdom to those seeking a treatment plan for him and lord we pray for all who have suffered with this virus we pray that you would Help it to just stop its um, circling around in our child care center. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others? Oh, Forrest. Okay, Corey. I got a text from a dear friend of mine that has to uh, bury their second child. I was lost in uh, during the birth process. So just prayers for them. This has happened to them twice now. So Gosh, I okay. can't imagine. I can't either. Losing one child, much less two. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. Corey's asked us to pray for a friend of his who's bearing a second child. Let's pray. God, for this family that is facing the unfathomable. We pray that you would send them your Holy Spirit for comfort. And for those, Lord, pray that you would strengthen them with the people around them to love on, lean on. Amen. And yes. Yes. So the people of the Ukraine, and you said the, and the people making decisions about it. Yeah. Let's pray for that. Holy God, we again bring to you our prayers for the end of violence in the Ukraine. We pray, Lord, for all those who make decisions that you would um, influence their hearts and minds to have peace, upper mind in their goals. Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others? All right. This is a blessing for when you're in grief. Blessed are you, dear, dear one, doing this holy work of suffering what must be suffered, of grieving what has been lost, of knowing the unthinkable truth that must be known. This grief can make you feel on the other side of glass from the world around you, a force field of different realities separating you. Yet blessed are you in yours, for yours is the one most seen by God, who breathes compassion upon you even now, who has walked this path and who leans toward you, gathering you up in arms of love. Rest now, dear one, you are not alone. And now may the God who loves all of creation, especially the broken parts, and Jesus, our companion on this strange path we call life, and the Holy Spirit who loves to improvise with us in amazing ways, may they be with you, dwell among you, and give you joy. Amen. This faith is good enough.